everyone. Welcome back to Tidbits. My name is Christina Koopman, and as always, thanks for joining me. A lot of what I'm going to talk about today is, of course, pre-COVID-19. However, I think it's important to keep a really close eye on how the pandemic affects museums and galleries moving forward and how they choose to orient their programming in response to it. Keep that in mind as we move on. Here's a big question for you. What role does social media play in contemporary art? This is a big question and one that artists, critics, and scholars have been debating pretty fiercely for a long time. There's an industry term called blockbuster shows. A current example of a blockbuster show would be the immersive Van Gogh exhibits that are on display in Milwaukee and Chicago right now. The commonly agreed upon first ever blockbuster show was 1976's King Tut, which toured the nation for, I want to say, a decade at least. These exhibitions are huge, drawing in thousands of visitors per day and generating immense financial value for the hosting organization. This is a good thing. Many of the attendees are not part of the normal art viewing public. They aren't people who normally go to art museums, but it's reaching a new audience. Without a doubt, the income and the new audience members are the two biggest pluses to hosting these blockbuster shows. On the other side of the coin, however, how many of those visitors will remain engaged after the show has moved on? It's highly doubtful they're going to become paying members of the organization or even continue visiting after that one big show is no longer on display. But is it the job of a museum to create this ongoing community or is it a transaction? The museum provides an experience, person comes in, pays for experience and then leaves. This is another gray area. That's number three for this episode alone. There's no written answer or right, right answer to that question. Additionally, these blockbuster shows can be monumentally expensive to put on, not just to host the artwork, although that's usually a huge expense, but also logistically, think about shipping, security, crating, all of that. With COVID-19 severely limiting crowds and hampering attendance, ticket sales are no longer gonna be the measure of your museum's excess. Right now and in the past, Selling a huge amount of tickets was enough to consider an exhibit a success, but I don't think it's going to be that way moving forward. A Japanese artist by the name of Yayoi Kusama has been one artist out of many whose artwork blurs the line between social media experiments and fine art. Her blockbuster shows featuring her famous infinity rooms drew between 50 to 75,000 visitors in weeks just weeks at the David Zwerner Gallery in New York City in 2018. Gallery figures reported seeing more visitors in one day than they typically see in three months while Kusama's infinity rooms were on display. So what makes Kusama's work such a good example of blockbuster shows? And how does she crack the nut to success in these exhibitions? Let's take a deeper look. <laughs> Yayoi Kusama, born March 22, 1929, is a 92-year-old Japanese contemporary artist who works primarily in sculpture and installation, but is also active in painting, performance, film, fashion, poetry, fiction, and more. Her work is based in conceptual art and shows attributes of feminism, minimalism, surrealism, pop art, and abstract expressionism. She is widely considered to be the most important artist ever to come out of Japan. Kusama was raised in Matsumoto and trained at the Kyoto City University of Arts in a traditional Japanese painting style called Nihonga. Kusama was inspired, however, by American abstract expressionism. She moved to New York City in 1958 and became a part of the New York City avant-garde scene throughout the 1960s, especially the pop art movement. Embracing the rise of the hippie counterculture of the 1960s, she came to public attention when she organized a series of happenings in which naked participants were painted with brightly colored polka dots. Since the 1960s, Kusama has continued to create art, most notably installations in various museums around the world. Over the years, Kusama has been especially open about her struggles with mental health. 
She says that art has become the way to express her inner self. She reported in an interview to Infinity Net magazine, quote, I fight pain, anxiety, and fear every day, and the only method I have found that relieved my illness is to keep creating art. I followed the thread of art and somehow discovered a path that would allow me to live, end quote. Kusama was born into a family who owned a plant nursery and seed farm. She began drawing pictures of pumpkins in elementary school and created artwork she saw from hallucinations, works of which would later define her career. The pumpkin came to represent for her a kind of alter ego or self-portrait. Her mother was not supportive of her creative endeavors, and Kusama's childhood was not a happy one. When she was 10 years old, she began to experience vivid hallucinations, which she had de has described as, quote, flashes of light, auras, or dense fields of dots, end quote. These hallucinations also included flowers that spoke to Kusama, and patterns in fabric that she stared at coming to life, multiplying, and engulfing or expunging her, a process which she has carried into her artistic career, and which she calls, quote, self-obliteration. She was reportedly also fascinated by the smooth white stones covering the bed of the river near her family home, which she cites as another of the seminal influences behind her lasting fixation on polka dots. By 1950, Kusama was depicting abstract natural forms in watercolor, gouache, and oil paint, primarily on paper. However, she began covering surfaces, walls, floors, canvases, and later household objects and even naked assistants, with the polka dots that would become a trademark of her work. The vast fields of polka dots, all also called infinity nets, as she called them, were taken directly from her childhood hallucinations. Quote, a polka dot has the form of the sun, which is a symbol of the energy of the whole world and our living life, and also the form of the moon, which is calm. Round, soft, colorful, senseless, and unknowing, polka dots become movement, Polka dots are a way to infinity, end quote. Ever since 1963, Kusama has created and continued her series of mirror infinity rooms. In these complex infinity mirror installations, purpose-built rooms lined with mirrored glass contain scores of neon-colored balls hanging at various heights above the viewer. Standing inside on a small platform, an observer sees light repeatedly reflected off the mirrored surfaces to create the illusion of a never-ending space. Curator Mika Yoshitaki has stated that Kusama's works on display are meant to immerse the whole person into her accumulations, obsessions, and repetitions. These infinite, repetitive works were originally meant to eliminate Kusama's intrusive thoughts, but she now shares it with the world. Claire Voon has described one of Kusama's mirror exhibits as being able to, quote, transport you to quiet cosmos, to a lonely labyrinth of pulsing light, end quote. Creating these feelings amongst audiences was intentional. These experiences seem to be unique to her work because Kusama wanted others to sympathize with her in her troubled life. Curator Badatri Chowdhury described how Kusama's lack of feeling in control throughout her life made her, either consciously or subconsciously, want to control how others perceive time and space when entering her exhibits. This statement seems to imply that, arguably without her trauma, Kusama would not have created these works as well, or perhaps not at all. Art had become a coping mechanism for her. The verity of his statement is a debate I reserve for another day, but it's interesting to think about. Again, does an artist's trauma define the work that they make? Much of Kusama's work fell out of the public eye after the 1960s. Many of her pieces were appropriated by white men, and she was never recognized or paid for much of her labor. She returned to Tokyo in the 1970s, where she still remains today. Her work was and still remains completely revolutionary. She still produces work at a shockingly fast pace, one that has landed her in health trouble multiple times over the course of her life. She now resides permanently at a mental health facility in Tokyo, by choice, and walks to her nearby studio. From this base, she has continued to produce artworks on a variety of media, 
as well as launching a literary career by publishing several novels, a poetry collection, and an autobiography, all after the age of 85. She does not seem to care much for the wealth she's accumulated later in her life, instead focusing on her own work. The re-emergence of Kusama's infinity rooms coincides directly with the rise of Instagram and social media as a whole in the late 2000s and early 2010s. Her Infinity Mirror series at the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington, D.C. in 2017 became a sensation among art critics as well as on social media. Museum visitors shared 34,000 images of the exhibit on their Instagram accounts, and social media posts using hashtag InfiniteKusama garnered 330 million impressions as reported by the Smithsonian. The works provided the perfect setting for an Instagrammable selfie, which inadvertently added to the performative nature of the works. It is perhaps the perfect artwork to succeed on social media. Kusama created altered realities based on what she wants people to see about herself. Isn't that the very nature of social media itself?